Hi, everyone out there. Hey, folks. It's us again. Back again. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so I have had a couple of really rough days. I've been just feeling really anxious and really tired and, and really overwhelmed by life. And, you know, I'm pulling through. I'm doing what I need to do. But I asked Adam last night if I could dedicate this episode to all of the patients and friends that I have out there who have dealt with worry and anxiety in their life because boy is that an issue for me right now i think we're both feeling it. <laughs> hey sebastian thanks for joining Hi, sebastian <laughs> um so today we're going to talk from personal experience about what our current situation is evoking for us in mm -hmm. terms of issues around worry and anxiety and i also think um, one of the reasons, I didn't tell Adam this, but one of the reasons why I wanted to um, open up uh, this particular episode was because I have seen so many of my patients who have been coming to me for a while now with issues around anxiety um, really thrive under Adam's care. And oh. so, so I thought this is a good opportunity to get a little up upliftment, if that's a word. <laughs> Maybe I just made that up myself because, um, you know, things can start to drag on me and, and it's a lot to, to, to close down one chapter of my life and open a brand new practice and manage all the needs of my family and my patients and my new staff and everything. Um, so I want to get some inspiration personally, so I'm doing this selfishly, but I also really wanted everyone out there who has had not had the opportunity to work with Adam professionally uh, in his professional um, self, um, the opportunity to get to know his mind a little bit better in terms of how he helps people who are struggling with simple worry that they can't sort of sort of get out of their mind all the way to really intense phobias and things because he is a phenomenal practitioner in that and he's had tremendous success so hopefully he'll come up on the fly because i'm surprising <laughs> him with this with maybe a case study or two um from recent history with with some of your patients sure. um but the 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 question of the day is this um why why worry what what is the the sort of primal and fundamental purpose of worry mm -hmm. and also um does it does it serve us in in good stead in any way mm -hmm. like are there times that we should be anxious mm -hmm. that we should be worried or is it just kind of a primordial figment of something that used to take care of us and now is just getting in our way yeah so um, I will open up the floor to you in just a minute. Wow. I will say that I do have lots of ideas myself about this, so we can kind of banter back and forth, but I really would like this to be an opportunity for you to, to showcase you and to talk about um, your answer to that question and, and how you help people um, move through those periods in their lives. Thank you. So without wow. further ado, <laughs> put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, really on the spot. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Hey, Dante, uh, thanks for joining. I'm glad um, that you found that hey, working Dante. with me to be a success <laughs> with your anxiety. Um, yeah, you know, I, it's really interesting because I think one of the things about anxiety and worry is that it's universal. Yeah. We all know what it means. It's not like depression where sometimes some people get it or panic attacks, which is like the, the other end of the spectrum. Uh -huh. We all know what it's like to worry. Right, and there's tons of songs that are written about it. From um, "Don't, Don't worry, worry, Be Happy,", happy. exactly <laughs> right. Um, Bob Marley's written on it. I mean, there's it's because it's it's something that we all get. But the question that you're posing is really an interesting one because worry or anxiety is a natural response to our fight or flight. Uh -huh. Right. So when we experience something unconsciously that threatens either our safety or our comfort or our sense of love, we get an unconscious response of anxiety. And that makes sense if we're living in caves, right? If all of a sudden we start getting this creepy feeling around the bushes, then, um, then we start becoming aware of our environment. And that serves us really well because we don't know if something's gonna jump out to eat us yeah. or if there's something that we might eat as well. I right? have to just interject here. Yeah. I 
I take walks in the evening time yeah. because after destroying my back, um, I don't, I'm not going to the gym. And so I'm doing, trying to get all my steps in every day and doing my core work standing up. And so I, as the sun goes down earlier and earlier, my walk time has turned into like this sunset into darkness walk. Yeah. So the second yeah. half of my walk, I'm in total darkness outside in Connecticut, which is different than walking in Manhattan. <laughs> Sad. Yep. And I've been really surprised at how comfortable I've been in my neighborhood. There's very few people out, but there's bunnies and chipmunks and deer, and it's just it's sweet and very pleasant, except for last night. <laughs> Both of us had a little bit of worry about you last night. Yeah, so last <laughs> night, I'm walking along my little trail that I do, and recently I discovered that it's better to have the flashlight on my phone pointing at the ground because otherwise I might trip and God forbid hurt myself again. Um, and last night I shine my, my little phone flashlight up and there's a pair of eyes about, I don't know, 25 feet in front of me. And they're kind of like shoulder height. And I thought- Really? I didn't realize they were that tall. Yeah, and I was like, wow. well, that's probably a deer. And right. then it started walking towards me. Yeah. And then I started thinking, well, maybe it's like a giant wolf. Like a werewolf. <laughs> or like, yeah, maybe. No. Okay. Now, I mean, or maybe like a mastiff, or like yeah. somebody lost a giant dog and it's rabid and it's going to attack me in the dark. And yeah. it could be a deer or it could be something else. And I tell you, I haven't been that scared in a really long time. Yeah. So that is the primal instinct. That's really primal. Yeah. Right. And there's something about eyes. I mean, eyes that, dark. that will just yeah. light up things yeah. for us, yeah. right? <laughs> And so we often have this thing about being chased. I mean, I have oftentimes I have clients who are talking about this kind of irrational fear that um, someone is chasing them or someone is watching them. Mm. And that's that primal instinct that kind of sometimes gets kicked off by some of the things in our environment that are not supposed to be tickling it quite so much. Uh -huh. So yes, if you're standing outside your cave door and all of a sudden you feel like you're being watched, that's really helpful. But if you're sitting in your bedroom and you're just stressed out because you've been looking at your finances and then you've been watching the evening news and then you've been looking at Facebook and all of these things are just kicking up these fears in you, right. sometimes we start to feel this kind of overwhelming worry and anxiety. Sure. And what's interesting is that that can be um, generalized. That doesn't have to be that, like there's something specific that's, that's causing it. Uh, and when we have that too often, mm -hmm. as I think you know, we can start to kind of get locked in a loop of that, mm -hmm. right? Where we're just constantly in this state and our body and our brain can't quite distinguish, should I be worried? Should I be anxious? Or is there a downtime? Is there a time to turn all of this off? So is that because there's no resolution to it? Like, you know, cause I've definitely <laughs> had periods where I've, for lack of a better term, like had kind of a floating worry or anxiety. So, you know, it starts off, something kicks it up. My, my the school calls because my kid's sick and I won't be able to pick them up. And they're gonna have to sit there for two hours or yeah. I open my bank account and there's less money than I anticipated or something kicks it off. Yeah. And then I've found that my, sometimes my brain will um, keep picking new things yeah. so that, that the worry keeps going. So yeah. I'll start the day worrying about one thing and I might end the day feeling just as anxious or even more anxious thinking about something else. So I'm no longer worrying about the thing that, that originally, originally started it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, what, what is that? Why is that happening? Yeah. Well, the thing is that we have a, an amazing tool, um, which is our imagination. Mm -hmm. And our imagination is su supposed to supply us with the opportunity to work through ideas. But our brain is kind of like a camera. It doesn't realize what it's looking at. So whatever you show it, it's going to continue looking at um, until it has a reason to stop looking at it. So if you th show it something scary or something that's worrisome, it will continue on with that. We kind of associate into that experience, mm -hmm. right? So if you're thinking about, oh my God, you know, my kid is, is alone at school and there's no one to pick him up your brain is going to just kind of start that story and just keep going with that story over and over because we've gotten really good at imagining. What's supposed to happen is that we're supposed to have a moment of worry or anxiety and then that turns off because we have to deal with some something else. Uh -huh. And so really what's happening is there's two systems in the brain. There's the limbic brain, which is kind of like a reptile brain. That's the part that kicks up the fight or flight. And then we have the prefrontal cortex, which is up front, which is the, really the executive 
decision making. This is one that makes all the, the important decisions for us. When the limbic brain gets too excited and we have too much stimulation and we have a day that's so exhausting where we've done so much, the prefrontal cortex gets exhausted. Mm -hmm. If you're a, at a day of sitting at a desk and you've just been making calculations and decisions all day long about who you're supposed to call and what emails so on and so forth, by the end of the day, that prefrontal cortex is so exhausted, it can't quiet down mm -hmm. the limbic system. Mm -hmm. And so the limbic system is just like, it just keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. Okay. So one of the things that I um, I teach, hey Dante, yeah, it is it is like perception. Yes, this is one of the things that we've been talking about is how we have different perceptions. Uh -huh. and, and so one perception, you know, of how things may be kind of turning out or the end result of something it has us locked in a loop of that story. Mm -hmm. But when we can kind of engage the a low level type of activation of the prefrontal cortex, we can quiet that anxiety. Okay. And so oftentimes that's what I teach a lot of the clients right at the very beginning when we're dealing with anxiety. Is that like the counting by threes thing? That counting by threes is exactly it, <laughs> okay. yeah. So anytime that we can um, use our prefrontal cortex, but just on a low level, we don't want to, engage it for heavy thinking. We're not trying to figure out, you know, how are you going to fix your car, but doing things like, like take and just said, counting by threes. Mm -hmm. um, I have another client who she puts a, a whole pocket full of change into her, into her pocket. And then she reaches in there and she has to figure out what denomination each coin is just by touching it. Again, mm -hmm. low level calculations, doing crosswords. Angry Birds is one of my favorites, right? Because it's using geometric type of, of spatial usage. So are you telling telling my patients to uh, play, to play angry? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not excessively, because then we just have a whole nother problem. But anyway, so that so that's that's just one thing that helps because uh -huh. the, the two can't exist in the same place. The okay. limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. Um, so but it goes back to your to your original question, which is well so why why do we worry? Mm -hmm. What is anxiety? You know, is there is there a biological purpose towards staying in that state. And I know about it from the psychological perspective, but from the physiological perspective, what's going on in the body when we get into kind of like that heightened um, locked state of anxiety? Hmm. Um, well, I would say to answer the first part of the question, I don't, you know, and I could be wrong, but as far as I know as a physician, there really isn't any good reason to stay in a heightened state of, um, of worry and anxiety for a long period of time. As a matter of fact, lots of studies have shown, and I've certainly seen it play out in my patients, those patients who excessively um, worry about their conditions have a much harder time getting them past that final stage of healing. Mm. Um, so, and, and I do blame Dr. Google a little bit for that. <laughs> um, not to say that a well-educated patient isn't, isn't a fantastic person to work with, but I will say that there's a lot of inflammatory and or sort of misinformation out there, partially yeah. because mostly what people are trying to do on the internet is sell something to yeah. you. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you start to read articles that are written by, semi-professionals of some kind, it often will lead you down to buying a product or a book. Or, right. But so, you know, when it comes to health information, there's just a lot of junk out there, right. you know, and there might be good insights or pearls, but I think between that and, and you know, the, the websites that like help you diagnose yourself, mm -hmm. right? So they'll say, here's a list of all of the symptoms associated with this type of cancer. Mm -hmm. And most of us have most of those symptoms, <laughs> you know, but people yeah. call me and they're like, oh, I have cancer. Right. You know. <laughs> Do you have a left foot and a yeah, right foot? Right. You might have cancer. <laughs> right. You know, a fatigue again, trouble, you know, sleeping. Right. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there there is a lot of reasons why people worry excessively in this world for a lot of really good reasons, and then a lot of things that we just don't have control over, and boy, is that a hard thing to let go of, right? Yeah. But the healing process, part of it is learning to trust yourself, not your the big kahuna up front, but all of the intelligence that's deeper in on a cellular level to do its job, because it really only has one purpose. Yeah. That's to stay 
in in alignment with itself and functioning well. Like yeah. That's all the body wants to do. Right. Right. That's right. literally its its goal. Right. Is to just be in homeostasis. Yeah. Um, so it wants to help you get better. So I would say that, you know, what I've seen in terms of worry is that patients who worry excessively have a much harder time getting better. That makes um, sense. Yeah. I mean, so I think that's part of the reason why I often recommend to people who are kind of heading in that direction that they work with somebody above and beyond just working with me because while we can support the body to do all of those wonderful things that it's trying to do for you, um, getting out of your own way can be the, the, the biggest component to healing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that being said, there's all sorts of reasons why you could feel anxious, even if your life is the most amazing thing that anyone's ever heard of. It's perfect. There's no stress. You love your job. Your family is healthy and amazing. Your home is wonderful. Your environment is fantastic. You love what you eat. I mean, nobody's like that. But yeah. even those types of people, when you rarely meet them, and it's true, and they're not just pulling your leg, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they can still feel, you know, you can still feel anxious. So, so what are some of those causes? Um, I would say that there's, there's, you know, inherited things that happen. So you get genetic set points. I know I'm always talking about genes, but it really is what programs to us to be who we are and how we function. Um, so there's, you know, there's SNPs and genes that help you produce um, and set the rate for the serotonin in your body, which is really essential and important that we make serotonin and produce it well for our digestive health and our mental emotional health. Um, there's all sorts of SNPs concerning dopamine and your other catecholamines, which are your stress hormones. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. Maybe you want to explain what a SNP is. Ah, ah. <laughs> a single nucleotide polymorphism. Whoa. Is, yeah, <laughs> You're not actually going in and cutting something. In, in something. No, it's but not. it is kind of a fun acronym. I like yeah. <laughs> because kind of what we're doing when we're looking at your DNA is saying, well, here's a little snippet of it, a little piece that is telling us something that maybe we could address in the context of the larger you. So I kind of like that it's called a snippet. I like it too. Yeah. Right. But really what we're looking at is just the coding of one part of the gene that you inherited from both your parents and what that's telling us. Well, so that's what's really amazing to me is because so often I'm working with um, a client or a patient who is um, dealing with anxiety mm -hmm. and their parent also highly anxious usually yeah and their kid also really anxious yeah. and you know and and trying to explain that to a parent hi rachel <laughs> <laughs> try you know one of the things that that's really difficult for a lot of parents is they feel like they gave that to their kid it is hard and that's that's anxiety provoking sure right there yeah. you know yeah. um so but it's interesting because you know as you're describing there is the the genetic component of it yeah but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have given it. No, because it's, you know, because there's an environmental factor that makes us even more unique. Um, so something interesting that I um, discovered last year was that there is a whole host of microbiota, so bugs, bacteria, that are supposed to be living our, in our intestine in a small amount that produce their own stress hormones. Mm. So they make epinephrine and norepinephrine. Really? There's yeah. bacteria that are that are making stress hormones. Yeah. So that is one thing that definitely wow. should be addressed for people who have anxiety because it could be that you are experiencing an anxious bacteria community. Wow. <laughs> that wow, that's that crazy. Well. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. So how would someone um, get something like that? Well, so there, you know, that's a good question because people will come to me and they'll be like, why are the bacteria in my gut there? And the answer is the sort of the milieu, you know, the, the soil, the underneath kind of environment just was just so that certain types of weeds started growing in your garden when you really wanted daisies and sunflowers. Uh, right? right. So, you know, I think about the gut really as a garden, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you're kind of growing these little creatures. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I've never been able to say the few people have said to me, why do I have this particular thing? I, I can't tell them exactly why they have it. Yeah. But I can say the situation was such that it, that the opportunity of this was, opportunistic was bug, yeah. yeah, they got the opportunity to, to, to grow and to do that. And the other types of bacteria that can kind of lead you down that path, even if you, um, are having no don't have any situational reasons for feeling anxious and are feeling anxious are bugs that produce a lot of histamine. Yeah. Um, because we know that histamine 
does several things in the body. It helps us to digest our food. It obviously is released when we are in sort of an allergic state, mm -hmm. but it's also a neurotransmitter. It's an upregulating neurotransmitter. Mm. Um, so sometimes I think that might be something that happens for me because I do have celiac disease. Is if I start to be exposed to certain things, I start to make more histamines, and then I can't sleep. Right. right. Because you think about taking an antihistamine. What's the first thing? The first thing I think about when I think about antihistamines is going on um, whale watches with my school when I was a kid really? and being given dramine and things that are antihistamines and like waking up like in the right. pool of my own drool <laughs> for like two seconds to watch a whale leap and then all like passing back up. <laughs> like it's, it's antihistamines put That's you to sleep. Did. That's right? true. Yeah, so the reverse, if you have a gut that's filled with bugs that are making histamine, can make you like really Super high alert. Yeah. yeah. So um, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, for me personally, maybe some other things that I could use this week just because I'm feeling so. But also, yeah. um, what are some of the tools that you, you know, the tools of the trade, the tricks of your craft that you often employ with people when they're in When they're feeling training? anxious. Yeah. Well, you know, the first thing is we have to figure out what it is that they're experiencing. So are they experiencing anxiety because of the conditions of their life? Yeah. Are they experiencing anxiety because there's something that's off physiologically for them? Um, or are they really just experiencing uh, something that's, that's happening, that's changed for them, um, and they're misinterpreting. We talked a while ago about mixed signals. Uh -huh. And oftentimes, a lot of time, I'm not oftentimes, a lot of times, that makes no <laughs> sense. Sometimes I have people who have suddenly started exercising and um, just that increased kind of, uh, if they're running or they're doing some really high intensity exercise, can be misinterpreted as anxiety or as panic because sure. the, the body can you know sometimes not tell what the elevated heart rate, what the what the the sweating and everything else is. Yeah, but well, um, we make more catecholamines in anticipation of exercise. Yeah, which I thought was really interesting. I remember learning that in physiology class. Yeah. So when you think about running on a treadmill and you're getting ready to get on the treadmill, you actually start making more stress hormones in anticipation. So your heart rate actually goes up before you start exercising because yeah. you're you know anticipating that need. Yeah. Them, right? Yeah. So. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I think is fascinating, then I'll get back to your question. One of the things that I think is fascinating is how we intentionally put ourselves in situations that cause anxiety, like I a roller coaster. <laughs> no, you don't. I know. That's why, I, that's why I love you. <laughs> but roller coasters, scary movies, um, you know, uh, documentaries on television, which are causing us to, to have a certain elevated anxiety. And there's something that's called uh, benign masochism, which is this kind of feeling, this thrill we get from being just a little too uncomfortable, but it's right on the threshold mm. of being overly so. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, I, when I think about it, I think about how it's similar to where worry and anxiety kind of meet, right? Like we sometimes that, that sensation of worry can be kind of similar to when we're watching someone in a horror movie who's you know creeping towards a door and we've got that that tense feeling. Mm -hmm. But what I think has happened is that we are in that experience so often that we've kind of gotten addicted to the stress yeah. of doing that. Well, what know? is it about, yeah, I mean, this is something that I've wondered because I am not an adrenaline junkie at all. Like I've never enjoyed going fast on skis or rollerblades or mm -hmm. I just aged myself. Nobody uses rollerblades anymore. <laughs> no one calls them rollerblades anymore. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, I just, I, I do not enjoy that feeling. Yeah. So, but I feel, I often feel like maybe because that was something that we were sort of primally, we would feel that every day, at least a certain part of our day, we were probably worrying about safety for our family in, yeah. some, in some capacity. Yeah. And I feel like people have, at least in our society, because we're so consumer based and we're so, um, we're such consumers of entertainment, like we expect the life to entertain us, that I wonder how and, and how healthy it is that we have sort of crossed those experiential signals. It's mm -hmm. like, 
-hmm. Why is feel and I have said this to you numerous times when you're like, let's watch a horror movie. You're like, I don't, want, <laughs> no. I don't want to. <laughs> let's watch Friends. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. Me. Yeah, I mean, what what is it? Why do we find feeling scared or uncomfortable entertaining? Entertaining, yeah. yeah. Well, that's exactly it. It's the benign masochism. It's and it's not everybody has it. Yeah. I certainly don't. Our son doesn't. You don't, but um, but our daughter has it a little bit. She likes to go on roller coasters, and she's like the only one out of all of us who do. Um, but you know, I think we we all kind of understand what that feeling is a little bit. That kind of thrill seeking, that being on the edge. Uh, and there's a part of me that you know would love to know what it's like to skydive. I don't really want to skydive, <laughs> but I would love to know what it's like. You know, and so intellectually, I can kind of understand. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one of the many different ways that we kind of access and are enthralled by our emotional states. You know, mm -hmm. our emotions are there because they're like a compass. They're designed to show us which way to go. We never really want to just stay, although we, we tend to stay in our comfort zone, we don't really want to just stay right in the center. We're always trying to explore and know ourselves more and experience more. So it's natural that we would want to kind of explore that as well both intellectually and emotionally. Mm -hmm. So going back to your original question, which was what can we do when we're in states of anxiety? Yeah, give us some tools. Well, here's one of the ones that is a technique that I developed, which is called the visual anchoring technique. And what visual anchoring is, is that if you notice when you look up or when you look down and you repeat the same sentence, mm -hmm. you will have a different feeling. Okay. So, so if you look up and you say, I'm really thankful for this day, I'm really thankful for this day. Mm -hmm. And then if you look down and you say the same thing. Just with your eyes or your whole face? You can do, it has to be your eyes, but okay. definitely your whole face. I'm really thankful for this day. Mm -hmm. Do you notice a difference between the two? I would definitely say I feel a little bit more cheery and uplifted when I look upwards. When you look upwards, right. So what happens is that we go internally and deeper into our feelings, particularly negative feelings, when we look down mm. and when we look up, we kind of open ourselves to more creative experiences, to more open feelings, to more positive feelings. Mm. So what we often, and that's, that's what you know, whenever you see yourself kind of, you, you've seen someone who's scolding a child, what's the first thing a kid does? Look down. Yeah, they go like this, right? Because we go negatively all down this way. And so what often will happen is, is that if I have a client who tends to feel anxiety or worry, in a particular time or scenario, I always make sure is that they're not involved in some kind of activity where they're doing this. So oftentimes if you're at work and you're having to do this all day, you know, long. All day long and yeah. you're in your thoughts and you're worried or you're trying to do your bills and you're doing this, you're exacerbating that situation. Mm -hmm. You can literally just lift yourself out of it by just looking up. I mean, you don't even have to think or say anything. Just doing that makes it harder for you to feel those feelings. Huh. Having a window um, makes it even larger. So there's a myriad of things that I use with the visual anchoring technique that help people kind of access their different feelings. Uh, I use it with our son, and I think I was telling you about that a little yeah. while ago. Um, but I'm it can- I'm impressed that he let you do that. Yeah, well, he was, his <laughs> mind was blown. And it, and it works as well from left to right. You'll find that there's certain things that you can access in, um, from the left side of you to the right side, mm -hmm. uh, which are harder or easier. So. So for, for people out there who are looking for something, easiest mm -hmm. thing to do, upper right-hand corner, if you're feeling anxiety or you're feeling like you're feeling something that you don't want to be feeling, whether that's fear or anxiety or negative self-talk, simply looking for most right-handed people in the Western world, and that's actually important because people who, cultures where they write from right to left as opposed to we do, or left to right, actually have this reversed. Um, Interesting. And Chinese, uh, where they're writing up and down, have that reversed as well. Wow. Vertically. Yeah, exactly. So, so looking down is more uplifting yeah, than looking up is more. For a lot of, a lot of those cultures. Huh. Yeah. In, in Israel and Middle Eastern uh, countries where they're writing the other direction, I often have to have them looking to the upper left hand corner. Interesting. But anyway, the point is if you're feeling something that you really don't want to be feeling and you want to get out of that experience, looking to the upper right, if you're a right handed person, will typically do that. Mm -hmm. Another place where I use this a lot, which is really great, is with runners, hmm. right? Because when we're running, 
um, and we start to kind of get exhausted and we start to feel like, I don't really want to do this, that negative talk, oftentimes I'll, I'll ask a runner, well, where are you looking when you're doing that? And they'll talk about looking at their feet and looking at their pace and so on. And their entire attention is focused downward. And I just train them to start looking up and to the right. Mm. And just doing that kind of takes you out of all of those feelings. Right? It really is interesting. Yeah. Someday I hope to be able to kind of map the brain activity and see what's going on in the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, you should. <laughs> when that happens. Nice. So, yeah. So I've used oh. that for, for a long time. Okay. So for my final question of the day, sir. Mm -hmm. um, so what I find, what happens for me, is when I get into periods of worry and anxiety, um, part of what keeps me in that state and keeps me um, kind of heightened and not able to resolve it yeah. is the concern that if I take my attention off of it, that I'm, it's not going to get resolved. Yeah. So for me, anxiety, I wouldn't know, I don't know, I'm, I don't know if I would describe myself as an anxious person, so maybe anxiety is not the right word, but heightened worry and attention to like detail and like, you know, okay, so is this has been managed? Is this managed? Are we doing all of this? And am I going to get the right grades when it was in school? And, you know, am I taking care of my patients? Whatever that is for me. Um, you know, I feel like if I take my attention off of it, then the, all the balls are going to fall out of the air right. and the whole thing's going to fall apart. And right. so part of what keeps me in a heightened state is this, is this worry that if I, uh, yeah, oh, another worry, yeah. that if I let, that I let go of some of the concern around these particular items that I'm dealing with in my life, that they're either going to worsen or they're not going to be addressed properly or whatever that is. And so it's really hard for me to put those balls down or yeah. to hand them off. Yeah. Um, and I assume that I'm not alone in this. This is something that happens for other people. Um, so, so how do you help people to differentiate between the worry and the actual task or, or you know, issue in their life that needs to be addressed? Because I know you've helped people move past like major hurdles in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, so clearly, you know, serious worries. So how do you help people differentiate? And then. Are there some kind of like, is there like an action plan that you help people put in place to, to manage some of these big things so that they don't have to worry about them? Or, or how, how is it that how you it, would help somebody? How do I do like that? Like that. Yeah. Well, I'm willing to bet Dante could mm -hmm. probably wax poetic on this because we've been working on this topic for a little bit. Okay. One of the things that you're describing is again, going back to that primal experience, which is you've got your eye on something and that something might be a threat. So you don't want to take your eye off it because you don't know what's going to happen if you let it go. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you are kind of fighting yourself. And what's ironic is, you know, when we see someone who's in a state of anxiety or worry, most of us who are not in that place, what's the first thing we say to them? Oh, just relax. Oh, don't worry. It makes me so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm so guilty of doing that with you. I know I am. Yeah. I know I am. Because, yeah, because it really doesn't, doesn't address the situation. Right, right. Yeah. All it does is make the person who's saying it feel better about the fact of the person. That they comforted them. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what you can do is, is change your experience or your relationship to the thing that you're worried about. So Albert Einstein had a wonderful quote, which is that a no problem can be solved within the same state in, under which it was created. Meaning mm -hmm. the brain or the mind that created the problem or that recognizes the problem isn't going to be the one to solve it. In order to solve a problem, you've got to be able to step outside of the problem and see it from another perspective okay. or from another another way. So it doesn't mean that you have to like not worry about it or let it go, take your eye off the ball. It just means that you've got to move to see it from another place. So what I often do is I help people kind of understand, okay, so this is how you're feeling. You're feeling this anxiety, you're feeling this worry, you're feeling stuck. Mm -hmm how would you prefer to feel about it? Mm. And when they can kind of identify what they want to feel, I move them, I help them move into that state. So if what they want to feel instead of worry is feel confident, or they want to feel um, sanguine, they want to feel just, you know, totally at ease and peace is usually the word that I hear the most. Uh -huh. I help them find a peaceful state, which do, that's not the solution itself. All that does is change their relationship to how they're seeing the problem. And then they go back and they look at the problem again. But now they're looking at it through the filter of peace or happiness or confidence. And the answer that comes to them is very different 
than yeah. one when you're in a state of anxiety. Mm. So it's like trying to find your way out of a box when that box is closing mm -hmm. in on you, right? You can't, like, you're just, you're just going to be totally panicked. But if you can step outside of the box and see the box as it's getting smaller, but you're not in a state of panic, you're going to see different things. You're going to notice different things. You're going to have different ideas. Yeah. And that's really what, what this work is. It's mm -hmm. helping them just change that perception. And, you know, any perception other than the one of worry is, is going to be helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. Even if you're seeing it, you know, as a lemur or you're seeing it right. from above or you're seeing it from, you know, not seeing it. Yeah. Any of those are a solution other than right. the one that you're, that you're looking at. Wow. So that's, yeah, so that's a lot of the work. That's the area of of process cognition uh -huh. that's and that's really what what we do is looking at how do you think what's the process of thinking hmm. as opposed to just kind of trying to figure out what's wrong well i'm sold too bad out of your way <laughs> <laughs> i take foot massages oh. <laughs> well adam thank you so much thank I mean, you honey you know and this was uh, this was a surprise i didn't yeah. have any idea you were gonna do well this. you know i just i so admire what you do I really do. And I know that there are people out there. I just, I know of many people who have just been just so touched by your work and so helped by it. And, you know, it's just so, so exciting that we're going to be working together, continuing going forward and expanding our understanding of what each of us do and how we can, you know, mold, meld that more even so that, so that what our, you know, our approach to helping the world is yeah. even more uniform and, I mean, it's just so exciting. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, um, there's going to be worry. There is for all of us. There's yeah. going to be anxiety. And I feel really blessed that I have a partner to help me through all of that mm -hmm. and to remind me when my feet are off the ground to put them back on the ground. And so I would say to everyone out there, you know, you're not you're going to find necessarily a taken, but I do oh. think I do think it's important <laughs> that we always remember that we're not alone and, yeah. and to find someone that can help ground us, not necessarily tell you, don't worry. Right, right. But helps help yeah. you see that other perception. Yeah. So thank you for that. Of course. Yeah. All right, All guys. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. And for those of you who are watching this after the fact, thank you so much for your interest in Wheelhouse and for Adam and for myself. Um, and next time, I believe we're going to be bringing in Dr. S uh, uh, Carrie Stasiak, yep. who is our um, uh, allergy expert. Yeah, she's, she's doing really amazing stuff, guys. You're really going to enjoy her. And she is, she's another member of the Wheelhouse team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, Wheelhouse is coming close to opening its doors. It's, it's amazing. We're not worried. Not worried. I'm not worried at all. I mean, we might not have a floor, but I'm right. not worried. <laughs> oh, and to that point, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah. this um, this week I was supposed to be in Las Vegas speaking at Hypno Thoughts Live, uh, I, one of the the country's largest hypnosis conventions. And because of some issues that we had at at Wheelhouse with the flooring and the front desk, I unfortunately had to cancel. So to anyone who was planning to see me there, I deeply, deeply apologize. I'm sorry for the for the last minute cancellation. Um, but this wheelhouse is our dream and it was something that just required that both of us be present for it. So I will be having lots of other speaking engagements. Hey, if you can make it to London in November, I'll be speaking the there on <laughs> the same topics. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, once wheelhouse gets going, we're gonna continue this on. Maybe we're gonna sit down a different practitioner in front of this little fun camera every week and just give you some tidbits into our new, what we're learning as practitioners, some helpful hints for you in your own lives and Adam's gonna probably be doing lots of those. So it's mm -hmm. another Both of way us. of- and as partners. Of, hearing what's coming up yeah yeah and what's new in, in your uh, wheelhouse yeah you know who i'm looking forward to oh. peter diadamo yes so peter diadamo. at some point i will get the master himself we're calling you out peter yeah. <laughs> and you know it may be facebook live it may be a podcast we haven't quite decided yet but at some point soon my my dear friend and mentor and teacher and uh, you know, creator of a lot of the uh, philosophies and beautiful software suites that I use in my practice. I wouldn't be who I am today without him. So I'm really excited for at some point for him to, to join us. Yeah, if you don't know about Peter, you should just
just look them up. Peter Diadamo, um, Generative Medicine, mm -hmm. and Eat Right for Your Blood Type yep. uh, Diet. I've been studying with him for many years, and he was a is and was a phenomenal physician in his private practice, and he's moved on to doing uh, software development and research and all sorts of uh, what he would call designing wonder tools. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so... This is it for now, and we'll be back next week talking about allergies with Dr. Kerry Stasiak, and we hope you guys have a fantastic week, and um, keep those anxieties in check. Right. <laughs> Don't worry. Be, be happy. happy. Do, 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 do. Bye. <laughs>